On the 14th of October, 1944, two generals of the German army arrived at this villa in Herlingen. It was the home of one of their country's most distinguished soldiers, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, his wife Lucy, and son Manfred. The Field Marshal, recovering from wounds he had received in Normandy, was there to meet his visitors. But this was no social call. After a brief discussion, Rommel left the villa with the two generals for a last short journey. Within minutes, he was dead by his own hand. What had happened to turn one of the Third Reich's greatest heroes into one of its greatest enemies, marked out for death by the Führer himself? Rommel had been a loyal servant of Adolf Hitler, but Rommel's reputation was never stained by the crimes of the Nazi regime. Rommel was laid to rest as a hero, but his death had been ordered by his Führer. The preparations for his funeral had been put in hand while he was still alive. The wreaths ordered. The tributes written in advance. It was all a charade. A matter of public relations. For Rommel had been implicated in the failed attempt to assassinate Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944. But how deeply was Rommel involved in the July bomb plot? Did he know of the plan to murder his commander-in-chief? From 1941, the reputation of Erwin Rommel had overshadowed that of all other German generals. A remarkable achievement for a commander whose victories were won in a theater seen by Hitler as a sideshow. In part, Rommel's reputation was fostered by Hitler himself, who had chosen two men, Rommel and General Edvard Dietl, to be his soldiers in sun and snow, to satisfy the German public's craving for dashing military heroes. Rommel remains a legend, as compelling now as when he ranged over the battlefield. Unlike Rommel, Dietl was an ardent Nazi who had played a part in Hitler's abortive military coup in Munich in 1923. Dietl remained a general in the snow, dying in a plane crash in Lapland in 1944. It is Rommel who remains to capture the imagination. Erwin Rommel was born on the 15th of November, 1891, in the town of Heidenheim, in Württemberg. He did not come from a military family. His father was a reasonably successful provincial doctor. Their home reflected the modest bourgeois origins of Erwin Rommel and his brothers and sisters. At school, he was a sickly, dreamy child. But as an adolescent, he developed harder edges and a keen mathematical mind. His father encouraged Rommel to join the army. In the summer of 1910, he became an officer cadet at the military school in Danzig on the Baltic. After cadet school, he joined the 124th Württemberg Infantry Regiment. It was during this period in his life that Rommel met Lucy Molin, whom he was to marry in 1916. The military world in which Rommel matured was one of simple, unquestioning loyalties, duty to the Kaiser and to the Fatherland. Even at this early stage in his career, however, Rommel stood out from his contemporaries. He was a non-drinker and non-smoker, dedicated to his profession. Soon, Rommel's professionalism and that of the German army would be tested in the heat of battle. In September 1914, Germany went to war. For more than two years, Rommel remained on the Western Front for the hopes of quick victory 
were replaced by the death house of trench warfare. He was a slight figure, but Rommel's courage and personality cast a spell over all who met him. The autumn of 1917 found Rommel in Italy, commanding a battalion of mountain troops. By now, he was the much wounded holder of an Iron Cross first class. As a young officer on the Western Front, Rommel had displayed a flair for infiltration tactics that had earned him a transfer to a mountain battalion. These units were designed to perform special tasks in small battle groups whose commanders were allowed a freedom of action far greater than would normally be permitted by their rank. This presented Rommel with the perfect opportunity to demonstrate his dash as a commander. At the Battle of Caporetto, Rommel led his troops deep into the Italian rear, capturing 9,000 men and 80 guns. His youthful promise had been more than fulfilled. Rommel was awarded the Pour le Mérite. He was 27 when the war ended in a German surrender, which was quickly followed by political chaos at home. To the humiliation of defeat was added the occupation by Allied troops of the west bank of the Rhine. Crippling war reparations were imposed on Germany and its army reduced to 100,000 men. Herein lay the seeds of future conflict. After the war, Rommel remained in the German army. A civilian life would have been unthinkable for him. He became the commander of a rifle company a post he would hold for the next nine years. Later, Rommel would train budding company commanders as an instructor at the war school in Dresden. Haunted by the slaughter of the trenches, Rommel declared that, first and foremost, he wanted to teach the Army's future company commanders how to save lives. In October 1933, Rommel was given command of a Jaeger battalion in the Hartz Mountains. It was here, in 1934, that he met Adolf Hitler, now Chancellor of Germany, for the first time. Rommel refused to mount the planned parade of his troops until Hitler's SS guard, the Liebstandarte, had been removed. It was a remarkable act of courage on the part of an obscure colonel so slight that his helmet looked like a coal bucket. Hitler had come to power in December 1933, his accession to Chancellor blessed by President Hindenburg, the aging symbol of Prussian militarism. Soon Germany was marching to a different drum, and Hitler had donned a military mantle. The passing of the old German military order was symbolized by the burial of Hindenburg at the massive monument raised to him in East Prussia, scene of a crushing victory over the Russians in 1914. Hitler now bound the German army to him with a personal oath of loyalty. As head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces, he was the dictator of Germany. Rommel and Lucy now had a son, Manfred. Rommel was still completely non-political, a soldier, pure and simple, uncomfortable in civilian clothes. Rommel reserved his contempt for the Sturmabteilung, or SA, the Nazi party's million-strong private army of stormtroopers whose ambition was to absorb Germany's small professional army in a process of permanent revolution. The SA was as big a threat to Adolf Hitler as it was to the army. In June 1934, Hitler removed the threat and secured the loyalty of professional soldiers like Rommel by ordering the murder of the SA leadership. The SA still marched, its torches blazing, but it was now toothless. Rearmament not only reassured the German officer corps, but also provided the basis for the rapid expansion of the armed forces. 
Skillful propaganda concealed their underlying weakness and played on the fears of British and French politicians who dreaded a new bloodbath even more terrible than that in France in the First World War. When Hitler reoccupied the demilitarized Rhineland in 1936 against the advice of the senior generals, the British and French sat on their hands. This bloodless victory impressed Rommel as much as it did millions of other patriotic Germans. And by now, Rommel was a man on the move. 1937 saw the publication of a best-selling tactical manual written by Rommel, The Infantry Attacks. That same year, the teacher of the officer corps became a student. Rommel attended the first of a series of Nazi indoctrination courses for army officers. He was now convinced that the officer corps must be politicized and be ready to fight for the Fuhrer's new policies. And Rommel himself was now playing a part in these policies, albeit in a minor role. In the autumn of 1938, Germany had occupied the Sudetenland, the largely German-speaking border area of western Czechoslovakia. When the triumphant Hitler arrived in the Sudetenland, his escort for the occasion was provided by a battalion under the command of Rommel. Rommel then enjoyed a less successful attachment with the Hitler Youth Movement, during which he fell out with its unappetizing leader, Baldur von Sirach. Soon, a German soldier's duty to fight for the Führer's policy would be transferred from the parade ground to the battlefield. On the 1st of September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Rommel, now a major general, commanded the Führer's personal headquarters in Poland. Walking at Hitler's side in the campaign and traveling with him in his curiously named command train, America, Rommel exulted that soldiers are worth something again. But Rommel, the simple soldier, was blind to the terrible fate already enveloping the conquered Polish nation. In Poland, the German army and air force had demonstrated, albeit in limited form, the new theory of Blitzkrieg, or lightning war. Six months later, in the Battle of France, the combination of armor and air power would overwhelm the French army and the British expeditionary force. Rommel was now commanding 7th Panzer Division. In middle age, and after a lifetime of service in the infantry, he proved himself to be a master of armored warfare, as the French discovered to their cost. After crossing the River Meuse, Rommel's division was at the heart of the German drive across northeast France, averaging as many as 50 miles a day. 7th Panzer moved so fast, it earned the nickname of the Ghost Division. But the havoc left in its wake was all too real. Rommel reveled in this exhilarating soldiering. He wrote Lucy, I've been in action for days on end, constantly on the move in tank, armored car, or staff car. There's no time to sleep at all. In a mechanized division, you've got to be so damned fast. So far, I have been. By the end of May, 7th Panzer had trapped half the French First Army, and within 48 hours, Rommel was recounting his success to Hitler at the Führer's headquarters in the Ardennes. The bond between Hitler and Rommel was strengthened when the Führer greeted him with the words, We were all very worried about you. Back in action, the Ghost Division raced over the River Somme, scene of the terrible carnage in the summer of 1916, and under a broiling sun, turned north towards the Channel Coast. Rommel, who was relishing the publicity he attracted, made sure that he was there when his forward tanks reached the sea, getting his boots wet for the cameras. At saint valery Rommel took a dozen French and British generals prisoner including a disconsolate General Fortune of the 51st Highland Division. 
By now, Rommel and 7th Panzer had taken nearly 100,000 prisoners. But his very success and the attention it attracted was breeding resentment among many of Rommel's peers in the army. In February 1941, while the rest of the German army was preparing for the invasion of the Soviet Union, Rommel was chosen by Hitler to lead an armored expeditionary force, the Afrika Corps, to help Germany's Italian allies in North Africa. The British had been giving the Italian forces in Libya a hard time. In December 1940, the British Western Force, commanded by Field Marshal Wavell, had launched an offensive from Egypt, which had driven the Italians out of eastern Libya. Rommel and the first elements of the Africa Corps arrived at the port of Tripoli in western Libya in February 1941. Undaunted by the rout of the Italians, Rommel defied orders and immediately went on the offensive. He caught the overstretched British deployed piecemeal and with most of their tanks in need of repair. They were unceremoniously swept back across the Egyptian frontier. The desert gave Rommel the opportunity to exploit his flair for the tactics of Rus and Bluff. He concealed the weakness of his armor from the British with dust clouds raised by convoys of trucks, which suggested a much larger force than he had at his disposal. For Rommel, victory was always sweet, but never sweeter than when he had fooled his opponent into a premature and needless withdrawal or surrender. For the next 18 months, Rommel retained the initiative, constantly in the thick of the fighting, a nightmare for his staff, as he was often out of touch with his headquarters, but an inspiration when he arrived at a critical point to lead the attack. The Desert War was a seesaw affair, confined to leaps along the Mediterranean coast from supply point to supply point, and swinging hooks delivered through the desert. Rommel's first offensive had carried the Africa Corps across the western border of Egypt and brought the port of Tobruk, held by the Australians, under siege. In November 1941, a new British commander, General Auchinleck, launched a counter-offensive which pushed Rommel westward, but failed to cut off the Africa Corps' retreating columns. Rommel excelled in the cut and thrust of desert warfare. He was unconventional in his handling of armor, often using his tanks as bait to lure the British armor into traps lined with his anti-tank guns. The fighting in the Western Desert was a soldier's war, in which both sides respected each other and their prisoners. There were none of the atrocities which made the war in Eastern Europe especially terrible. Out of uniform, the Desert Fox was disarmingly ordinary, a small, balding man with a head which seemed too big for his body. In action, flying into the front line in his Feastler Storch, Rommel was an electrifying figure. He even forced Alkenleck to write, I am not jealous of Rommel. In January 1942, Rommel resumed the offensive. He drove the British 8th Army eastward, fighting a bitter battle at Gazala, which forced Auchinleck to retire to a position at El Alamein, inside the Egyptian border. This time, Auchinleck could not save Tobruk, but in July, he inflicted a decisive check on the overextended Africa Corps at the First Battle of El Alamein. It saved 8th Army, but did not save its commander. The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, decided to dismiss Auchinleck, later likening the business to shooting a noble stag. Auchinleck's replacement was General Bernard Montgomery, who arrived in North Africa when the tide was turning in favor of the 8th Army. British fighter bombers were playing havoc with the Africa Corps' Mediterranean supply convoys. 
Rommel was now a field marshal, but a baton was no substitute for the oil and tanks the Africa Corps had been denied. Exhaustion and illness sapped its commander's strength. In contrast, Montgomery resisted Churchill's promptings to launch an all-out offensive until he was confident of the marked superiority in men and material. Like Rommel, he was haunted by the senseless waste he had witnessed in the First World War. Like Rommel, he was a husbander of men's lives, although Monty's methods were those of caution rather than daring unorthodoxy. Monty kept a portrait of his charismatic opponent in his caravan headquarters, the better to get to know the enemy. Rommel did not return the compliment. The ailing Rommel was in Germany on sick leave when, on the night of the 23rd of October, 1942, Montgomery opened the Second Battle of El Alamein with a massive artillery barrage. Rommel came hurrying back to North Africa, but could not stem the breakthrough made after a week-long infantry slogging match by 8th Army's tanks. By nightfall on the 3rd of November, Rommel was down to his last 30 serviceable tanks. He was left with no option but to order a general withdrawal on the 4th. Montgomery had the victory he had promised Churchill. Rommel, ill and exhausted, could promise no more than a fighting retreat. After an agonizing delay, Hitler approved Rommel's request to withdraw. Rommel's next task was the preservation of an army of 70,000 men on a 2,000-mile fighting retreat under constant air attack. British codebreakers at Bletchley Park monitored every detail of Rommel's westward progress, harried but not destroyed by 8th Army. But foul weather and Montgomery's innate caution preserved what was left of the Africa Corps. Meanwhile, on the 7th of November, British and American troops came ashore in the Vichy French colonies of Morocco and Algeria. Operation Torch threatened to trap the retreating Africa Corps between two Allied armies. The Torch landing force had the men and machines, but as yet did not possess the fighting metal of the Africa Corps. When they came face to face with Rommel's retreating veterans, the raw troops of the American Second Corps were given a savage mauling at the Kasserine Pass. But Rommel was now on the edge of physical collapse, like a marathon runner tottering towards the tape. Victory at Kasserine had freed him to turn south to settle accounts with the pursuing Eighth Army, but he was repulsed at Medanin on the 6th of March. Montgomery wrote, Rommel attacked me at dawn. It was very foolish of him. I have 506 pounder anti-tank guns. I have 400 tanks and I have good infantry holding strong pivots and a great weight of artillery. The man must be mad. Within a month, Rommel had left North Africa for good. Far away in his headquarters in East Prussia, Hitler refused to allow the Africa Corps to withdraw to Sicily. The Führer had just lost one army in Russia at Stalingrad on the banks of the Volga. He would now lose another on the shores of the Mediterranean. When Rommel had recovered his health, he was ready once more for active command. In August 1943, he was appointed commander of German troops in northern Italy. German strategic horizons were now shrinking. In 1942, at Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia, Rommel had discussed with the Führer Plan Orient, the seizure of the rich oil fields of the Middle East. Now the European perimeter of the Third Reich was under threat. Hitler's sweeping geopolitical daydreams had been blown away to be replaced by the grimmer concept of Fortress Europe. Rommel was now to be the architect of concrete barriers rather than sweeping battle plans. 
At the end of 1943, Rommel was appointed commander of Army Group B in northern France under the Commander-in-Chief West, Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt. At the top of Rommel's agenda was the strengthening of the so-called Atlantic Wall, the Third Reich's western perimeter defense, which propaganda claimed stretched some 1,700 miles from the North Cape to the Spanish frontier. But in reality, only the most sensitive sectors were fortified. Within weeks of his arrival, Rommel had increased the rate of mine laying from 40,000 a month to over a million. Half a million obstacles were laid on the beaches and likely airborne landing grounds behind the wall. But Rommel knew that the wall alone would not defeat an Allied invasion of Northwest Europe. Mindful of the almost total air superiority now enjoyed by the Allies, Rommel, once the master of mobile armored warfare, was convinced that he would have to get his guns and armor to the water's edge at the moment the Allies came ashore. Only then could they be defeated. At a conference in Holland, he told officers of 88th Corps, all your forces have got to be committed to the defense of the coastline itself. In this, he was in fundamental disagreement with von Rundstedt, who favored holding back a strong armored reserve ready to strike when it became clear where the main Allied blow was falling. Rommel argued that Allied air attacks would smash up any attempt to move large bodies of armor by day. Movement and attack by night would end in confusion. There was no satisfactory resolution of this heated tactical debate. Nor was there any agreement on where the Allies would land. Von Rundstedt believed that the Allies would take the shortest sea route across the Pas de Calais. Rommel became increasingly anxious about the possibility of landings on the western coast of Normandy, between Cannes and Cherbourg. In the end, he was proved correct. The Allies had decided to land in Normandy as early as the summer of 1943, but they employed a brilliant deception plan to persuade the German High Command that their intention was to land farther east, near Calais. Dummy air forces came to life around the port of Dover. Landing areas were prepared to accommodate landing craft made solely for the benefit of the handful of Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft allowed to penetrate British airspace. Bantam radio traffic from a handful of mobile transmitters created an American first army group in southeast England, poised to breach the Atlantic Wall in the Pas de Calais, the invasion route favored by the German High Command. Its highly visible commander, General George S. Patton, was real enough, but his destination weeks after D-Day was to be Normandy. The Germans swallowed the bait. Meanwhile, Across the English Channel, another top-secret operation was underway. A plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. The war had seen several attempts to kill Hitler. Not all of them genuine. In November 1939, a bomb exploded 20 minutes after he had left his annual reunion with old Nazi comrades in Munich. It had been planted by the Gestapo with the aim of increasing the Fuhrer's popularity. The beer hall setup and the propaganda funeral of those killed in the blast did not deter the genuine military and civilian plotters. Among them were two staff officers in the German army, Major General Baron Henning von Treskow and Captain Fabian von Schlabendorf. In 1943, they nearly succeeded in killing Hitler when the Fuhrer visited the Russian front. They placed a brandy bottle packed with British plastic explosives aboard the aircraft, which was to fly the Führer back to his headquarters in Rostenburg. But the bomb had a faulty detonator cap. It failed to explode, and the bogus brandy bottle had to be retrieved from Rostenburg by the gallant Tresco. Hitler, it seemed, had a charmed life. The circle of conspirators in the German high command grew wider. By the spring of 1944, it had drawn in General Karl Heinrich von Stuttnagel, the military governor of occupied France. In Berlin, the main conspirator was General Ludwig Beck, 
who had been the German Army's chief of staff in the 1930s. The military and civilian conspirators against Hitler comprised a number of groups with different aims, but they could all see that the war was lost. They were convinced that the destruction of Germany and its subjugation to the Soviet Union could be prevented only by a speedy surrender to the British and Americans. To achieve this, Hitler would have to be killed. Rommel remained loyal to Hitler, to whom he had easier access than most, but he was also a realist. As the prospect of the Allied invasion approached, Rommel was torn between patriotism and his duty as a professional soldier. He knew that Germany would be crushed between the Soviet Union and the United States. Rommel's feelings about Hitler had originally been straightforward. Rommel, the uncomplicated soldier, was grateful to his Führer for rescuing and then restoring the fortunes of Germany. As he had proudly put it in 1939, soldiers are worth something again. But the gathering evil which had accompanied this revival, indeed had fueled it, was beyond Rommel's comprehension. Nevertheless, Rommel's loyalty to the Nazi regime was being severely tested. He was eventually to conclude that if the Allies gained a foothold in France, Germany's only option would be to seek peace with the British and Americans. Then the three of them could march east against the Russians. This might have been militarily feasible, but it was political fantasy. Rommel's reasoning, like his character, was without guile, but it was to draw him into deadly danger. Rommel was ignorant of the plans to kill Hitler, but a senior officer who was aware of what was going on was his new chief of staff, Lieutenant General Hans Speidel. Speidel, a laconic fellow Württemberger, was up to his neck in the plot to kill Hitler. Now he was working alongside Rommel in the latter's headquarters in the Chateau of La Roche-Gouillon near the River Seine. The defenders of the Atlantic Wall were readying themselves for the Allied invasion, but none of them, from the humblest private to the exalted commander of Army Group B, knew where or when it would come. The Allied deception plan had worked its spell. For Rommel, however, there was a domestic matter to attend to. His wife Lucy's 50th birthday was on the 6th of June. On the 4th of June, Rommel left La Roche-Gouillon for Herlingen. Speidel remained in charge of Rommel's headquarters. On the other side of the channel, the countdown to D-Day had begun. In the small hours of the 6th of June, American paratroops landed in Normandy on the western flank of the Allied beachhead. Off the Normandy coast lay the Allied invasion armada. With the dawn came bombardment from the air and from the warships lying off the coast. The invasion of Northwest Europe had begun and in the sector which Rommel had anticipated. By the end of the day, 60,000 Americans and 75,000 British and Canadian troops were ashore. The panzers with which Rommel had planned to smash the invasion on its beachheads were held back. Rommel's headquarters at La Roche-Gouillon was infected by a peculiar calm. As the evidence of the invasion mounted, Speidel remained inactive. He even returned to bed. He did not ring Rommel at Herlingen until 10 on the morning of the 6th of June. There were three panzer divisions within striking distance of the invasion beaches. Speidel declined to move them. Was he looking over his shoulder at the Pas de Calais, convinced that the main blow was yet to fall? Or was his sluggish reaction to the crisis a deliberate attempt to ensure Allied success? At 10 p.m. on D-Day, a grim-faced Rommel arrived in Normandy. As he had feared, Allied air power was making the daylight movement of men and armor extremely hazardous. Displaying all his old energy, Rommel now threw himself into the battle which was raging in the sunken lanes and hedgerows of the Normandy countryside.
It was now that Speidel revealed to members of his staff that he had been plotting against Hitler. The conspiracy was seeping out into the open. While the German armor was grouped and regrouped, unable to land a heavy punch as the Allies pushed inland, Speidel engineered a meeting between Rommel and one of his fellow conspirators, Lieutenant Colonel Caesar von Hofacker, von Stoltnagel's adjutant in Paris. Allied bombers and the efforts of the French resistance were disrupting the German buildup in Normandy. On the 11th of June, Speidel called on von Rundstedt's chief of staff, General Blumentritt, telling him for the first time about the opposition to Hitler, but not about the plans to assassinate him. While Speidel talked to Blumentritt, Rommel was conferring with von Rundstedt. The result was that Marshal von Rundstedt sent a gloomy signal to the Führer, informing him that if he could not establish a stable front line in Normandy, von Rundstedt would be forced to make what he termed fundamental decisions. As Speidel and Rommel drove back to their headquarters, Speidel attempted to draw his chief into the circle of conspirators, playing on the field marshal's troubled conscience over stories of the death camps established in eastern Poland. Later that day, Rommel voiced his alarm to Army Group B's naval liaison officer, Admiral Ruga. Pacing the grounds of La Roche-Gouillon after dinner, Rommel suggested to Ruga that the German army in the West should surrender. He hinted that the Nazi leadership had blood on their hands, adding, I have always fought clean. Rommel then wrote to his wife Lucy, it's time for politics to come into play. All the while, both Rommel and von Rundstedt were looking to the Northeast for the anticipated arrival of Patton's first U.S. Army Group, one of the decoy efforts which Speidel's compliant intelligence staff gave the utmost credence. It also seems that on his own initiative, Speidel was withholding a vital panzer division, the 116th from the Normandy front, calculating that it would be needed to deal with the SS garrison in Paris after Hitler had been removed. By the 15th of June, Rommel was sufficiently depressed by the overall situation in Normandy to compare it with the dark days of early November 1942, when he had been forced to concede defeat at El Alamein. He demanded that a representative of the High Command come to Normandy to see for himself the odds against which his troops were fighting. He was in for a surprise. On the morning of the 17th of June, Hitler arrived in France to meet his generals. The Führer had divined that Rommel was in the same mood which had overtaken him before the retreat from El Alamein. The line of retreat from Normandy led straight to Berlin. Rommel, von Rundstedt and their respective staffs traveled to meet Hitler at his headquarters near Soissons. In this bunker complex, 300 miles from the fighting in Normandy, Rommel and von Rundstedt confronted the Führer. In the presence of Hitler, Rommel seemed to regain much of his old confidence. For the last time, the Führer cast his spell. He told Rommel that thousands of V-1 rockets were now raining down on a defenseless London, an exaggeration which seemed visibly to put a new spring in the field marshal's step. It would not last. On the 26th of June, the Americans broke through at Saint-Lô and began to seal off the Cotentin Peninsula. To the east, Montgomery was hammering away at Cannes. Patton's Phantom Army Group still haunted Speidel's staff. On the 27th of June, it warned that there were huge forces in southern England readied for an invasion in the Pas de Calais. In fact, there were only 12 divisions on the other side of the channel, all of them destined for the fighting in Normandy. At the end of the month, Rommel joined the senior commanders in the west for a conference with Hitler at the Berghof, the Führer's mountain retreat in Bavaria. Rommel had told von Rundstedt that the war must be stopped now. I intend to make no bones about it when I see Hitler. 
At the Berghof, Rommel bravely attempted to confront Hitler with what he knew to be the truth. He told Hitler he could not leave the meeting without speaking on the subject of Germany. Hitler asked Rommel to leave the room immediately. The conference continued without Rommel. He was never to see Adolf Hitler again. Back in Normandy, Rommel received yet another visitor. Field Marshal Kruger, a veteran of the Eastern Front, had arrived to replace von Rundstedt as Western commander. Kluger knew of the plot against Hitler, but had kept his distance from it. Kluger and Rommel did not hit it off when they met. By now, Struppnagel in Paris and Speidel at Rommel's headquarters were becoming increasingly desperate to win Rommel over. Once again, the persuasive Hofhacker was dispatched to La Roche-Gouillon to draw Rommel into the circle of conspirators. The mission sealed the field marshal's fate. Hofhacker returned to Paris, convinced that he had won Rommel over. Rommel, however, remained ignorant of the plan to kill Hitler, a move he would never have supported. But in Paris, Hofhacker told his confederates that Rommel had placed himself entirely at their disposal. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Hofhacker then traveled to Berlin, where he met his cousin, Klaus von Stauffenberg, the wounded veteran of the Eastern Front who had been chosen as Hitler's assassin. On the 16th of July, von Stauffenberg informed the plotters that the field marshals in the West were with them. Haunted by the specter of defeat in Normandy, Rommel was torn between lingering loyalty to Hitler and his duty as a professional soldier. On the 16th of July, Rommel delivered an ultimatum to Hitler in the form of a report to Kluge. Everywhere our troops are fighting heroically, but the unequal struggle is drawing to a close. In my view, the political consequences of this must be drawn. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army Group, I feel obliged to make myself plain. Time was running out for Rommel. The roads on which he drove 250 miles a day in his powerful staff car were regularly strafed by Allied fighters. On the ground, a team from the British Special Air Service, the SAS, were keeping a watch on La Roche-Gouillon and awaiting the arrival of a hit squad to assassinate Rommel. One of the senior German officers in whom Rommel had confided was Sepp Dietrich, the commander of the 1st SS Panzer Corps and one of Hitler's oldest associates. On the 17th of July, Rommel had asked Dietrich if he would always obey his, Rommel's, orders, even if they contradicted those of the Führer. Dietrich told Rommel that he would. Meanwhile, the bloody battle for Cannes was moving towards its climax. Rommel's old adversary in the Western Desert, Montgomery, had finalized his plans for Operation Goodwood, an armored drive to smash through the stubborn defenders of Cannes, which had defied Allied bombardment and attack for over three weeks. But Rommel was to play no further part in this battle. After the meeting with Sepp Dietrich, Rommel drove back to La Roche-Gouillon. At 6 p.m., his staff car was attacked by two Spitfires. Rommel's driver was killed, and Rommel received serious head wounds. One of the Spitfire pilots caught their target with his gun camera. Rommel's luck had run out. The Allied air power he had feared had removed a vital piece from the Normandy chessboard. Rommel regained consciousness in the Luftwaffe hospital in Bernay on the 18th of July. The struggle for Cannes had been his last battle. Two days later, at Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia, von Stauffenberg placed a briefcase bomb under the table at which Adolf Hitler was holding his daily conference. The explosion ripped through the room, killing three officers, but sparing Hitler. The next day, the Führer greeted Italian dictator Mussolini at Rastenburg. The plot against Hitler had failed. 
In Berlin, troops loyal to Hitler moved quickly against the conspirators. Many of the ringleaders, including von Stauffenberg, were summarily executed. Others faced torture and then trial in Berlin before the People's Court, presided over by fanatical Nazi Roland Freisler. Freisler's personal reign of terror ended when he was killed in an air raid as he was about to open the trial of Fabian von Schlabrendorf. The brave von Schlabrendorf survived the war. In France, von Kluge, who had hung back from joining the conspiracy, was to commit suicide when relieved of his command and ordered back to Germany. Rommel, recovering from his wounds at home in Herlingen, also fell under suspicion. Two days after the bomb exploded at Rostenburg, he had told Speidel from his hospital bed that the incident would have undreamt of repercussions. Dread spread through the conspirators. Summoned to Berlin, von Struppnagel botched a suicide attempt. In his resulting delirium, he was heard murmuring Rommel's name. Huffacker, who had been urged to flee, stayed put and, in an attempt to save his own skin, fingered Rommel. Huffacker was hanged in December. Gestapo reports of the suicide attempts and subsequent interrogations were rushed to Hitler. On the 12th of August, Heinrich Himmler, chief of the SS, arrived to see the Führer. In his briefcase was a notepad on which was written, Item 6, West, Kluge and Rommel. The shadows were closing in on the Desert Fox. And on General Speidel, who was interrogated by the Gestapo and then, at the beginning of October, called before an army court of honor. Inevitably, the trial of Speidel was also the trial of his boss, Erwin Rommel. Speidel, the great survivor, wriggled free. Rommel, who had no friends at Hitler's court, was doomed. At Herlingen, where he had been convalescing since the 7th of August, Rommel knew that he had been placed under constant surveillance by the Gestapo. On the 7th of October, Rommel received a summons to Berlin from General Keitel, Hitler's chief of staff. He declined, pleading poor health. Plans were already being made for Rommel's funeral. On the 13th of October, General Wilhelm Burgdorf, Hitler's senior adjutant, traveled to Herningen from Berlin. Burgdorf was accompanied by Major General Ernst Meisel, head of the legal section of the personnel branch of the German army. Burgdorf and Meisel arrived at Rommel's house at noon on the 14th of October. The field marshal received them in his Africa Corps uniform. Before Rommel left with the two generals, he told Lucy and Manfred of his fate. He had been given the alternative of trial or suicide. He had chosen suicide. Death lay 200 yards down the road, a cyanide capsule in the back seat of Burgdorf's limousine. Hitler had many of the conspirators hanged on piano wire and then drooled over the film of their death agonies. Rommel, who had never contemplated Hitler's death, remained a hero to the German people and was given a funeral to match his status. Manfred, an auxiliary firefighter, paid his last respects with his mother. Before he drove off with Burgdorf and Meisel, Rommel had told Lucy that he did not fear trial and was innocent of any involvement in the plot to assassinate Hitler. But Rommel had been prepared to support the removal of Hitler as a preliminary to negotiating a surrender to the British and Americans, and he had openly discussed these plans with a number of people. Rommel knew only too well that this was an act of treason for which he would have to pay the ultimate price. Rommel never feared death. Its wings had brushed him many times. He was a patriot, and above all, 
the general in the sun.